Hi everyone. Um, thank you for thank you for coming and attending. Uh, I'm Quentin. I've been working on BPF for about five years now. Um, I started at Sixwin, then I worked at Netronome on uh, BPF hardware flow. Uh, so the objective of the presentation today is just to give you an update about the latest BPF um, features, maybe what's getting inside uh, the, the BPF architecture in the kernel, uh, what can be used to create um, more efficient programs and uh, these kind of things. So um, I start with BPF basics like uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the core features of BPF that are evolving uh, and uh, present also the, the new features we're getting with the latest uh, patch set. And depending on time, also a word about the BPF universe, I mean uh, BPF tooling and projects based on BPF yourself. So uh, just before we start, a uh, few reminders about uh, how eBPF works. So you get uh, programs compiled from C most often uh, with Clang or LLVM and then injected from user space into the kernel uh, where you can uh, attach them to one of the existing hooks. So that can be TC or XDP or sockets. Uh, for networking or k probes for tracing and so on. Uh, before attaching them, you have to make sure that those programs won't crash your kernel, so you have a verifier that makes sure the program is safe and terminates. Uh, you can also JIT compile it to have um, a, most efficient, um, a more efficient uh, execution. So the characteristics of such programs, they are using 64-bit uh, long instructions, they are using 11 registers, including one for the stack, uh, which is 512 bytes. Uh, you can have about uh, 4,000 instructions in a program and you don't have loop load. Um, well, that was true at least at the beginning. So we have had a few changes of that uh, recently. So uh, the stack is still 512 bytes, but you do have a mechanism that can allow you to, to, to use more indirectly. I'll come back on that later. Uh, excuse me. Um, we don't have the same limitation as before in terms of uh, the number of instructions in a program. So you could have only four, uh, four key instructions. Now you have up to one million instructions. It's not really that I can have any program uh, doing uh, one million instructions. It's the number of instructions that will be validated by the verifier. So the verifier emulates all the execution path of the program and it can check up to one million instructions and that went up from um, uh, 130,000 or so uh, a few few months ago, a few years ago, I don't remember. Uh, so we have bounded loops too now in uh, starting from uh, kernel 5.3. Uh, they are bounded in the sense that you must still ensure that your loop will terminate. So basically the verifier needs to uh, make sure that you, you won't be doing weird stuff uh, that could introduce uh, infinite loops in the kernel, but uh, that's pretty useful for the, for the, for the um, most often use cases that needs loops, so that's uh, quite, uh, quite nice to have. Uh, in terms of performance, I won't go too much into the details, but we have a number of performance improvements that are happening in the kernel for BPF. Uh, so LLVM can favor 32-bit sub-registers uh, in the programs and we get better performance and lower code size uh, for some architectures, mostly 32-bit architectures. Um, that was especially relevant uh, when I was at Netronome because we are trying to make the, the, the programs as small as possible to make them fit on the cards, for example. Uh, one of the latest uh, addition to BPF is a new set of subcommands. Uh, that can help you work with maps uh, and especially when you want to do a lot of operations on maps like look up a high, high number of values or date a high number of values in a map. Uh, before that you would iterate over each entry in the map, so hash maps, array maps, uh, compatible with BPF, and you had a risk of hitting a deleted entry if the entry had been deleted before, the, uh, before you reach it in the list. And now you have those batch operations that can help you make that faster, more efficiently, and without this risk. Um, AFXDP gets some improvements too. 
but there's a presentation on page pool, I think, later, so I won't uh, mention AF XDP here. Uh, so I jump to what's actually new in terms of just new things you can do with um, BPF. Uh, but that, that's still pretty low level. I'm not talking too much about new use case really because we're still focusing on networking. So that's still the, the, the classics anti DDoS and um, load balancing. I'm talking just about what new uh, things you can use in your programs themselves. So we have uh, BTF, which is BPF type format. It's a format for, for data close to Dwarf, which is used for debugging programs on Linux. It, uh, BTF provides information uh, for BPF programs and maps too. Uh, so one uh, simple example is here. We have a dump from the, the program that's running uh, inside the kernel. And we can see that we still have the C instructions that were used uh, to compile this program. So the C instructions were encoded into BTF and send along the, the BPF bytecode to the kernel so we can uh, keep track of them. Um, so BTF is not really one of the latest features in the sense it's been around since uh, 4.18, but it's receiving a lot of a uh, lot of changes, a lot of improvements, uh, and it's used by more and more features too. So that's why I'm mentioning it. Uh, it's generated with PA hole or LLVM. Uh, BTF objects are verified in the kernel for consistency, so you cannot just introduce any any BTF uh, object that you like, it has to match with the program or maps you're using. Um, we can also produce uh, a BTF blob for all the symbols in the kernel. Uh, we do need a specific configuration option for doing that, but after that you have BPF data available in the CFS uh, system file that allows you to, uh, to access to all the symbols uh, that can be used by BPF probes, for example, when using BPF on trans uh, points or K probes, uh, it allows you to access uh, data structures from the kernel, just not with uh, with an offset uh, from the beginning of the struct that we as we had to do before, but uh, directly with the name of the field in the struct, and that's especially important for trying to compile a tracing program just once and being able to run it on a variety of kernels. Uh, that might have changes in that structure depending on the compilation options or kernel versions. Uh, so that's what we could compile once, run everywhere for BPF. Um, but really, it, it's being used for a lot of things. So we also have now global data in, uh, in BPF, which means, uh, sorry, which means that we can use global variables in a BPF uh, source in C and uh, in, it translates into data being stored in specific uh, sections of the ELF file. Um, and that's, uh, that's useful for making BPF templates in one way. So you can just have your object file that you compile from C uh, with this global data in read-only sections, and then you can just uh, update the read-only sections instead of trying to, uh, to find the relevant information the, in the code section. And uh, so you can adapt your program uh, with that to, to, to a variety of use cases or configuration changes. Um, this global data can be is used with uh, maps somehow to, to, to interact with user space too. So you have a possibility to map them from user space and to, uh, to be able to read them uh, and to see what the, what the program in the kernel is using. Um, something close to, to global data is uh, another kind of variables. It's external variables, so you can have external something uh, in a C program that you compile into BPF. It's actually limited to a fairly small number of variables, which are Linux kernel version and the config uh, underscore something that you can use to configure your kernel. And uh, so this is one thing that relies on BTF, for example, uh, support for those external variables. And using them makes you able to adapt your program to uh, with uh, clauses like if I'm using a Linux kernel version that is higher than 4. Dot, uh, something, uh, you can uh, adapt your program. Uh, we have VPF trampolines that can convert um, 
the, the native calling convention, so the host calling convention into BPF calling convention. It's, uh, it's a way to attach programs uh, more efficiently to entry and exit of functions. It's useful for, um, for networking program too, because now you can attach program at the entrance and exit of uh, XDP programs, say, and see all incoming packets to your BPF program and outgoing packets, so you can see the changes that occur, for example, so that, that would be uh, a good thing for debugging. It can also be used in the, what, what is called the BPF dispatcher, which is a mechanism of reusing those BPF trampolines to avoid the cost of uh, red ponies um, following uh, meltdown and uh, spectre <coughs> attacks uh, when putting XDP programs. So we get also performance improvements through that. Another thing is uh, global function and dynamic li linking, which appeared uh, just in the, uh, in the latest uh, weeks or days. Um, we have um, a global function supported by libbpf now, which means uh, functions you're using in your main, uh, uh, call, you're calling in your main program don't have to be static anymore. Um, and uh, the, the, they can be loaded as separate programs. Uh, no, sorry, the functions are loaded inside your program and they act as placeholders. So at runtime, you can jump from your BPF program into another BPF program of type BPF prog type X, sorry, and uh, come back. So just as you would do with a regular function call, but there are different BPF programs. So you're starting to get something that can be really modular and you could imagine building a BPF library that can uh, be injected as a set of small programs and call them from a main program. So that allows for uh, dynamic policies. I want to change the, the, the processing of that packet depending on what its uh, metadata are. Uh, that can help for code reuse. I don't want to uh, use the same snippet in all my programs. I can just call it as an extension. Uh, and since I have uh, less code reuse, I get a shorter verification time too, because I just need to, to inject those extension once. Um, another mechanism that appeared recently is uh, the possibility to overwrite the struct ops in the kernel, which is uh, quite restricted at the moment because there is uh, some wrapping to do in the kernel for the struct ops, so those structures that hold operations to do. Uh, on some specific um, uh, algorithm. So the only one that's uh, being uh, handled now is TCP congestion ops, and uh, Martin Caffello, uh, I think, used that to, uh, to re-implement uh, custom TCP congestion control just with BPF programs by uh, overriding the, the operations that are, do, that are being done by default in the kernel. Um, so that's a possibility to, to introduce uh, new use cases to. Uh, there is more to come very likely because uh, the, the community is very active. We have uh, improvements on XDP, uh, so multi-buffer XDP is being discussed, egress XDP is being discussed, uh, static linking, um, that would be the, the merging of several uh, object files into just one uh, BPS, so you could have uh, really library in, in, written in C about BPF programs and <coughs> just compile them together uh, to have your BPF programs is uh, being discussed To We'd like to have step-by-step -step debugging one day to, uh, to be able to better debug BPF programs. Uh, some other use cases too, there is a Linux security module uh, based on BPF which is being discussed at the moment, uh, not merged yet. Uh, I wanted to make a brief update about the tools and projects, uh, but I don't have much time, so I'll just leave this slide, and if you have uh, some questions, maybe I'll take them now. Thank you. Yes. So, so do I think the, the possibility to do mmap on uh, some values is going to be the end of uh, the regular way to, to uh, use a BPF system code to communicate with maps between user space up kernel? Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't think so. Uh, because it's restricted to, uh, to some specific use case. I think it will be global data for now. 
Um, and uh, I mean, you have a lot of different map types and a lot of different things you can update in them, and that would not necessarily be suitable for m mapping things. Uh, <laughs> so the more we can m map, I suppose, the best it gets in terms of performance, but we're not just here yet in terms of replacement. Uh, time's up, so if you have any other questions, please come and let me know. Thank you.